Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, church. Good morning. I'll never get tired of this. <clears throat> and I was glad that finally Neil accepted, humbly accepted his title as a bishop. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> we continue the series of messages that we called The Supremacy of Christ. And the title of my message today is Supremacy in Everything. Supremacy of Christ. Supremacy in Everything. And it's based on, uh, on the book of Colossians chapter 1. Verses 15 through 20. All scholars agree that the book of Colossians, in the book of Colossians, Paul is contending for the true gospel against some heresies, heretical teachings. And by the way, <clears throat> the material that I'm sharing today is so dense, so theological, that I'll have to teach more than preach. You're used to me preaching. I'm going to be doing more of a teaching today. So you have to work more. My friend George, uh, once we met, <clears throat> and he, he was, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to help him and kind of mentor him as a preacher in the church. And he said, what's the difference between preaching and teaching? And I told him, you know, and we were in a Mexican restaurant. And you know, it's yummy, it smells yummy, and everybody is eating. I said, look, here's the preaching. The preaching, I stand up, I grab a fork, and I go, ding, ding, ding. Excuse me. I would like your attention for just a second and I begin to speak something that should distract them from their food. I can't go deep, but I get their attention and I nail something important into them and then I leave. That's preaching. Teaching is when you have to work. It's, it's more of a like, okay, let's, let's help somebody move from one house to another. I grab this, you grab that, we move together, okay? You got the picture. So today we're moving. All right. Is that all right? You, you understood? Okay. Okay, so Paul, in a number of his letters, he fights heresies, specific doctrines or teachings that are detrimental to Christian faith. So today, my, my passage is exactly the same, this kind of a passage where Paul just blows, just hits this heresy hard with, with a dense text that lifts Jesus Christ up and gives, gives him the place of preeminence or place of supremacy, highest supremacy. <clears throat> uh, before I dig into the text, I need to say a couple of things of the word heresy. How many of you know, heard the word heresy? Okay, well, here's the thing. I need to say what heresy is. Originally, it was a very neutral word. It just means a choice, something that you pick. It's like you come to a buffet and you're like have a just a small plate and then you're wondering what is exactly I'm going to choose and pick from the buffet, from the variety of things. And that's what was the word, your choice. That's what you choose. Later, it began to identify a, a sect or a party or a school or a, a particular group or a faction with certain beliefs, like a political party can be called uh, a heresy. <laughs> but but uh, soon after the church, Christian church appeared, the word heresy began to evolve and began to have a connotation, negative connotation of a harmful false teaching. It became a technical term and it began to mean a harmful false teaching about the nature of God, about the nature of Christ or about the nature of salvation. I'm teaching you guys. I'll get to preaching too. Don't worry. I'll wake you up. <clears throat> So before I continue, it's important to say what heresy is not. Heresy is flippantly used. Like every time you hear something new, something strange that you're not used to, you're, you have a tendency to say, that sounds like heresy. That's heretical. Well, when I was in seminary, a friend of mine who is, uh, uh, right now he's a, he's a theology <clears throat> professor, he told me that, hey, you got to be careful with this term heresy or heretical you shouldn't just label everybody left and right if it sounds like something that you haven't heard before it's not necessarily a heresy heresy is not just any theological opinion that is different from what you're not accustomed to there are many diverse teachings that vary widely 
and even contradict each other that are not heresies they're just different interpretations different opinions for example good example is end time teachings eschatology that's why we don't preach it here and we don't teach it here because it's it's basically don't ask don't tell policy because there are gazillions of different versions and we don't want to be divisive about those things they're not essential another good example is like i was raised in the pentecostal circles in the, in the charismatic circles and for them holy spirit is very important but unfortunately the teaching was developed that basically split christians into two camps first grade citizens and the second grade citizens the first class citizens were the ones who are baptized with the holy spirit and how do you know they speak in tongues well let me tell you something as as with as the years goes by and i speak in tongues i believe in this gift i believe in the gifts of the spirit, holy spirit i speak in tongues a lot i pray but i wouldn't today i would not agree to this teaching i would not agree to this first class christians and second class christians because i've seen enough idiots that pray in tongues for hours and act like jerks and i've seen the beautiful pictures of christ exhibited through people who who do not speak in tongues how do you explain this so hey just an example so one, one more time, this is a good chance for me to tell you. You don't have to subscribe to everything that I believe or Neil believes. In fact, I'll let you know the secret. Probably Neil and I don't agree on many things. But it doesn't give him a ground to brand me as a heretic as well as it doesn't give me the ground to brand him as a heretic on Facebook. I've only done it twice. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. So heresy is different heresy is actually limited in scope and it's a deviation from the essential christian doctrine that we called orthodoxy that's another thing that you need to know about heresy heresy is not a self-sufficient term it's it's a it's a binary concept like an antonymic is that the word antonymic you know where there is up there is when there is left there is when there's heresy there is oh smart <laughs> smart orthodoxy that's right so orthodoxy is not just everything that you're used to it's a very specific scope of teachings that are considered to be essential for your christian faith and for your christian walk central to christian orthodoxy is the doctrine of the holy trinity Trini the, the, the trinity the word trinity is not in the new testament i told you this many times it was coined later because these controversies took place with different heretical winds of teachings took place within the very first four centuries of christian church history and special very specific terminology was coined to to help people understand and contend for the gospel and among those terms was holy trinity trying to denote this amazing deep mystery that christ came to reveal about the nature and the being of god that god is not a solitary abstract powerful being but rather a relationship of love a relational being above all and before anything else so in the second one another central doctrine is the doctrine that jesus is fully god and fully man they even coined the term god man theotropos you know in in greek so <clears throat> why is it a big deal why 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 dennis why do you bring it to us and trust me every time we prepare a message neil and i i want it to be relevant to our life i don't want to talk about abstract theological things that have nothing to do with how i treat my wife no but here's the thing essential element of christian doctrine always have ramifications in the practical areas of life Amen. and the, that's why it's a big deal when you unconsciously allowing heresy to affect you because it's going to have consequences in your christian walk 
So heresy is a teaching that is harmful to believers. Heresy is like a disease that render, can render you sick, weak, and barren, fruitless. And please do not demonize people who preach and spread heresies. They are people. They're not demons. They're good people. Sometimes they're very good people. That's the most puzzling thing because I wish all heretics would be ugly and horrible and would have a coffee smell all the time. But they're not. Very often they're very nice, loving, and caring people. But their, their, their sincerity does not negate the harmful effect of the heresy. The funny thing is most everybody in America identify themselves as Christians and some have very poor and sloppy ethic like work ethic. You know Mormons very often have a great work ethics and great family ethics. Mormons don't cheat. Mormons take time to their kids. Mormons are amazing human beings yet they're heretics. The same thing can be spoken about Jehovah Witnesses and the same thing can be spoken about many different uh, flavors of Christianity. Do you already register the difference that I'm teaching more than preaching today? I make you work, right? Some of you are already sweating. That's good. <laughs> so, and you know, it, it should not be treated lightly. Paul said, try to correct the heretic twice if he's not open, if he's not willing, just remove yourself apostle john the apostle of love they say that at the very late age in his ministry he was around 90 years old he would come to the people and people were adoring him because he was such a loving person and and he was the only one left there who still who was walking with jesus so every time an old apostle john would come to speak something people would be like and he would come, they say, the legend has it, he would say, children, love one another. And he would leave. <laughs> Great message. But he, this, this apostle of love, he would write things like, do not receive a heretic into your house. Do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. That sounds harsh. Because he saw the, that's why guys, you know, the, the, the goodness of a person and the sincerity and good intentions are not enough. There is a great illustration of that. You know, in 19th century, uh, in Vienna, in the city of Vienna, there's a historic case of people who had a great intentions, who de dedicated themselves to serve people and to save lives, dedicated themselves, dedicated their hands, but unfortunately, later they found that their hands that they dedicated to save people were used to kill people and i don't know many of you may, may, maybe some of you heard this story <clears throat> there was a particular hospital and all of a sudden there was a huge spike in mortality in little children just like newly born babies and the mothers pregnant mothers and nobody could figure it out that was a mystery and one doctor, Hungarian, I think he was, I don't remember his name, he was observing and he came up with a theory that explained this, this mysterious spike of mortality. You see, they had some kind of an internship for medical students and those students had this routine of learning the uh, anatomy by doing the autopsy. Do I pronounce it right? You know, working on the dead, deceased uh, patients in the mornings and in the evenings they would help in a maternity ward and he said there must be a connection between the spike there must be something that these people bring on their clothes or on their hands that kills these babies and these mothers and to prove his theory he decided to introduce a strict uh, policy he created the solution powerful solution of chloride like lime juice or something and he said everybody going to the maternity ward must wash their hands thoroughly and they did and the miracle happened that's a picture of somebody sincere but carrying the germs of her heresy that's why it cannot be tolerated <clears throat> 
So enough said about that, I think. So spiritually speaking, heresy is like, like a teaching that carries deadly bacteria that can kill your joy, take away your peace, and, and take away and steal the experience of God's grace in your life. So let's look specifically at the heresy that Paul is contending against in the book of Colossians. There are several, and Neil will probably touch some others in the, in the future messages, but in this one, he is dealing with the heresy that made Jesus smaller and it moved Jesus to the periphery of the Christian vision. You see, that's what happened. They, these people, whatever they taught, they still used the same vocabulary and lexicon. They still talked about God a lot and maybe even talked about Jesus. But whatever they were teaching using the biblical text and biblical lexicon removed the focus from the person and the work of Jesus Christ. In their consciousness, listen to this, in their consciousness, God may still be number one Yet Jesus was not. That's a sign of infection. That's a sign of infection. So let me read this passage, the central passage of today. It's Col Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. I'm going to use NIV. And by the way, that's, a, that's an interesting fact. Paul is using a poetry to convey, to convey doctrine, very important doctrine. He uses a quote from what's believed by scholars to be one of the earliest hymns to Christ, about Christ. Uh, it was discovered, I believe, in the 60s of last century because the, the, the scholars who are really good with Greek, they noticed that the, the text of epistles, sometimes the flow of the text breaks and it's something else. And they got... They started digging into that and they discovered, oh, it's a poetry and most likely it's a song or some kind of a chant. You see, in many cultures, before there was a printing press invented by Gutenberg in, in what it was, it 15th century, I don't remember. And before the literacy became a common thing, a lot of people were illiterate and a lot of people could not possess the, the written documents. So how do you remember the most important information? that you need to remember. You put it on a melody and you begin to sing it or chant it through the day until it's internalized and it's part of you. Like, I have no clue what my phone number is, but I can just like close my eyes and say, Boo! because I said it so many times to so many people. And I, I, I still remember some of the verses that I learned this way. Well, anyway, it's a distraction, but it's, it's good for you to know that this is actually one of the ancient hymns of the church that they were singing to each other. So let me read it. Verse 15, the sun is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. He and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have supremacy for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross wow if if you drift and start daydreaming in the beginning of this passage and you wake up in the middle you would be sure it's a lofty solemn hymn attributed to God and you're right but at the very end he says who is he talking about he says he reconciled everything by making peace through his blood 
on the cross. He's talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about two people who are contemporaries of Jesus Christ. It's, it's Jesus is early near contemporary of these guys and he died the most humiliating death on the cross and now he's talking about Jesus as the one who created everything and who sustains everything and for whom everything was created. Whoa! He, he gives this vaccine against this heresy. He gives this immunization to these guys so that they would not get sick by believing that Jesus is something smaller than God himself. And you would say, Dennis, is that relevant? Is that heresy relevant? Very much so, unfortunately. Absolutely relevant. Millions of Christians talk about God and Jesus using scriptures, yet in their consciousness, the term God denotes someone who is higher and bigger and more important than Jesus. Many of us are under the influence of this heretical wind. Only you can be honest with yourself and check yourself in your heart whether you might have shreds, you might have the influence of this mindset. When you think, yeah, Jesus is important, but not as important as God. Well, hello, my friend, he is God. Amen. You see, from the very outset, true Christian faith requires confession of Jesus' identity as God. Yet scores of people who identify themselves as Christians miss it. Listen, several years ago there was a survey conducted in the deep south of the United States of America in the Bible Belt, Christian College, 1,000 students uh, interviewed. Listen, just to see what is their understanding of the essential claims of Christian faith. 98% of these college freshmen claim to be Christians. 60% of them grew up in churches. And yet one third did not know that the New Testament and historic Orthodox Christianity teaches that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And most of these students believed that Jesus was just a special man of God who was endowed with amazing powers by the Holy Spirit but nevertheless were a mere man. That's how widespread this heresy is. Christian college, Christian students, Christian boys and girls. So you see there are scores of sermons, books and teachings that use the same Bible that we use to draw your attention to something else and before you know it Jesus is in the periphery of your Christian vision he is important every Christian say Jesus is important and yeah but he's not the focal point of your life anymore and before you know it you know what happens if you let this heresy to take root in your heart before it happens there are only two players in your life in the, in the story of your life. It's God and you. Do you understand that this is not a Christian picture? This is a heretical picture. If it's just God and you. Your God is not identical with Jesus. If, if your God is not identical with Jesus... Before you know it, it's you who are trying to live for God. It's you who are trying to have faith in God. It's you who are trying to surrender yourself to God. It's you who are trying to love God. It's you who are trying to please God. It's you, it's you, it's you. Christ is in the periphery now. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at this heresy that took so, such a deep roots in American churches today. And before you know it, the very essence of the ministry of Jesus, which Paul calls mediation, is gone. The result of this ministry is so-called unmediated life, which is an oxymoron. 
There is no such thing as at the end of the day you try to build your own relationship with God. You and God. God and you. Where is Jesus in there? It reduces Jesus to someone in the past. Very important. Very cool. He's done something great. Now it's me and God. I'm dealing with God directly. You never deal with God directly. If you look at the very last book of the Revelation. Very last book of the Bible. The book of Revelation. You see the throne room of God. The final consummation. Who do you see on the throne? The Lamb. The Lamb of God who took the sins of the world. You will never have God direct. Oh God, there's no such thing in the New Testament as just God. Paul switched from that. When he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he stopped being a Pharisee. His faith was, his theology was destroyed, but he gained the new vision of God. He would never call God God. He would say, God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God and the Father, you cannot separate God from fatherhood. You cannot separate the son from the father. This heresy, what it does, it separates the father from the son. And if you don't have the father, if you don't have the son, you don't have the father. Do you hear me? That's why it's important, guys. And I don't care what, how nice those people can be who would say, yeah, I don't believe in Trinity. Oh, yeah, I don't believe that Jesus is God. Well, if you're not open to listen to me, goodbye. I'm not talking to you. I'm sorry. You're a nice person. I don't want to contract this disease. Amen. Our relationship with God apart from Jesus are not possible. You see, that's what a lot of churches are missing today, the mediation of Christ. They, they lost it. They, all, they reduced it to something that has been done shortly in the past, and now it's all on them. And if you live like that, that's not a Christian life, and you will never be able to rejoice, and you will never be able to love. You walk in fear. And there's torment in fear. There's, there's a pain in fear. There's... Perfect love casts out fear. And perfect love is manifested in what Christ has done, what God has done in Christ. You know, I'm not going to go there, but sometimes I told you before, sometimes I wish I would know the mediation of Christ and I would hold on to this picture of just me and God because it sells great. Neil and I, I guarantee we would be able to grow this church, triple this church within like couple of years we'll build a new building fine by selling you well packaged Christian formulas to success five steps to success according to the Bible four secrets to walking in power or I don't know three principles of walking in God's favor only hundred dollars and if you sign up today it's only 20 bucks those things are bull crap. We would tell you uh, like uh, effective ways of prayer. Dennis, are you telling prayer is not important? No, listen to me, listen to me. I'm not telling prayer or Bible or anything else that we do as Christians is not important. But I'm telling you that if you remove Christ, it's a bull crap. We call them on purpose. We call them the means of grace. We call them the means that enlarge your capacity to receive the grace of God. The question is, where does the grace of God come from? Jesus alone. Not in the past only. Now. You need Jesus. Not when you just don't know anything. You need him now. And you have him now. And in him you have the fullness. I love the fact that Neil stressed so, much, so many times last time the perfect tense of the things that God the Father has done through Christ Jesus. It has been done, paid in full. Walk in this now. Walk in this now. If you still think, oh, I, I, I'm forgiven today on Sunday and on Monday I showed a finger to a driver on the way home. 
and now I'm not forgiven anymore. Now I have to go home and deal with God again and ask him forgiveness and maybe get some of the blood of Jesus and stop this nonsense. You walk in forgiveness whether you show the finger or not. Well, if you did something wrong, acknowledge that. Confess it. Say, oh, I was stupid. I did something stupid. If you did something stupid to your spouse, come and say, hey, honey, I was so stupid last night. I'm so sorry. But with God, you're forgiven. You're accepted. And you have all the fullness. You have all the fullness. Gee, I have five minutes left. I switched from, from teaching to preaching. You're right. Okay, okay. Here's the, here's the very practical questions for you to ask yourself, to diagnose yourself, to see if you're under the influence of some of those heresies. Don't answer, don't answer out loud. Just, just take it down, apply it to yourself. Try to be honest. Try to be very honest with yourself. The question is, is Jesus Christ the focal point of your life? And it's not to bring you guilt. It's to correct you out of heresy into orthodoxy. Is Jesus Christ the focal point of your life? If not, that's okay. He can be today. Is he your God and Savior? Is Jesus the carpenter, the Jewish carpenter from a little insignificant village of Nazareth, is he your God and Savior? Is he, create, cre, is he the creator of the universe for you? Is he the one you worship? Imagine a whiteboard like they use in schools. And imagine just two words in the middle of that. God and right next to that Jesus. And you're given the mathematical symbols of equals, signs, uh, greater than or smaller than. Which one are you going to use? That's right. That's orthodoxy. If you use sm smaller than or greater than, that's a heresy. It's very simple. It's very simple. So, <clears throat> okay, let's just unpack few, some of the things that uh, Paul unpacks in this passage. And I, I barely, you know what? Whether I, I, I can uh, deliver the rest of it or not, I feel like I, I, I really did what I'm supposed to do. I really did. So, but, but I'll just unpack a few of the things in the text. So the Son is the image of the invisible God. The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He is the ultimate revelation of who God truly is. As Karl Barth, famous theologian, said, there is no other God behind the back of Jesus. And Western churches for centuries have been teaching heretical things that Jesus is saving you from God. Which is an absolute bull crap. Amen. I use it three times today already. I, uh, got my quota. No more. But it is. It was God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. You see the Son, you see the Father. As Neil said, Jesus put the face on God. Face, the eyes, are the expression of the inner reality of the person. Before there was a face in God, there were just uh, educated glimpses. When Jesus appeared, you got to know God for who he is. Jewish people had a doctrine that you're not supposed to even try to portray God because it's impossible. He's, eff, eff, what's the word? Eff, effable? Ineffable, thank you. Inexpressible. But what if God says, what if I do it myself? And he did. And so that's, that is a strong call to redefine your God in the light of Jesus. Everything that existed before Jesus must be red, redefined through the lenses of who Jesus sees. Amen. And I want you to, uh, to see that 
that he's not just one of the revelations. He is the ultimate. He is God himself making himself visible. And it's not just the words of Jesus. A lot of you, you know, you, you, you remember those Bibles that have words of Jesus in the red? It's, it's not the best concept. Because I understand the intent like, oh yeah, these are the most important things in the Bible because Jesus himself said that. No, the revelation of who God is is Jesus, the person of Jesus. Not just the words of Jesus as a teacher and preacher. The, everything about Jesus. His conception, his childhood, his growth, his life. You, and another thing that you need to understand, if you study Paul, he's not, he's not referring to a lot of details of the earthly biography of Jesus. How do we know things about Jesus from the Bible? Well, we read four Gospels. Well, tell me, what are four Gospels? What's the span of time that they cover? At least three years. Some people say three and a half years or like, we don't know exactly. But my question, before it started, before Jesus was conceived and birthed, was there Jesus? Was there Christ? Absolutely. Well, you go gazillions of years before plus eternity Jesus is there then you go after Jesus is lifted up at the end of the Gospels and you go to any year after that 2024 for example is there Jesus oh yes and he's well and he's alive and he's risen from the dead so this period this period of three years is called by theologians, I used that term before, kenosis. You know what kenosis means? It means pouring himself out, emptying himself, leaving almost nothing. So whatever glorious glimpses of Jesus' glory we see in the gospel, it's still God being emptied for the sake of us. And you know what? This is the revelation of who our God is. If you see God through the eyes of the gospel, you see God who is willing to take time and to go through the most humiliating experience for the sake of you. That's my God. My God wa wanted to die for me. My God wanted to, to lay down his life for me. My God wanted to pour out himself and empty himself. That's who our God is. But that God disappears if you detach Jesus from the Father. And if you say Jesus is not God. Jesus Christ is God Almighty. And according to that scripture, he's also sustainer of everything. He's the beginning of creation. He is the purpose of creation. He, he's, he sustains everything. He sustains physical world. He sustains all institutions that humans, like this church is sustained by Jesus. Yes. Oh gosh, I have more material for you today that I can, but I, I'm out of time. Let me just, let me just read because I, I, I encourage you to do this today, if you may. Find a good time when you are peaceful. Open the book of Colossians today or this week and read chapter 1, especially verses from 15 to 20. And remember, it's a poetry that speaks to the heart, but it's also the highest truth that is like inoculation against disease, spiritual disease. And I'm going to read at the end, before we start, as we transition to worship, I'm going to read a translation that may not be the most accurate translation, but it's a very good retelling or rephrasing. It's, it's called the Passion Bible, the page, Passion Translation. And I'm going to read the same passage in the Passion Translation so that we would have this, this, uh, this poetic side of it, so that we would prepare our hearts to worship Jesus today. Okay? So, let me read it. He is divine, he is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God. He is the firstborn heir of all creation. He is, 
For in him was created the universe of things, both in the heavenly realm and on the earth, all that is seen and all that is unseen, every seat of power, every realm of government, every principality, every authority, it all exists through him for his purpose. He existed before anything was made and now everything finds completion in him. He is the head of the body, which is the church. And since he is the beginning and the firstborn heir in resurrection, he is the most exalted one holding first place in everything. For God is satisfied to have all his fullness dwelling in Christ. And by the blood of his cross, everything in heaven and on earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. You are in Christ Jesus. You are safe. You are restored, and in Him you have fullness. Let's worship Him. <laughs>